timekeeping and the floor is all yours. Awesome, well thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be able to talk to you all today. Um, I was asked to talk to you about um, the technique of combining high spatial uh, resolution and high spectral resolution and how it's helping us find and characterize young exoplanets. Um, so really what I'm interested in is how do we go from the image on the right hand side, these few pixels that show us um, beta pic B, one of the directly imaged planets, how do we turn it into something on the left hand side, as in how do we learn about it really as if it were in our own solar system and we could say something more about its maybe its rotational properties or what it actually looks like if we actually see its atmosphere close up. So I want to take you through some of the techniques that we're do, uh, doing at the moment to try and do that. Um, and Andy's already given a really great introduction to how um, some of the instruments work that we'll be using for this. Um, so I'm going to focus quite a bit on the techniques themselves um, and not too much on the interpretation than what we get at the end, um, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Okay, so in this talk we have high spatial resolution or what I might refer to as high contrast uh, imaging um, and then we have high spectral resolution and I want to tackle that second part first. So why do we need high spectral resolution? So if we think about a high resolution spectrum is going to contain lots of information. Now, most of the exoplanet spectra we have um, for transiting exoplanets, and we've done some really good ones, um, and they come from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the resolution for that, by the time we've actually binned the spectrum down into data points that are useful to us in terms of how small their error bars are, um, they typically have a resolution of about 30. If I was to plot that on here, um, where I'm showing you a small wavelength region in the K-band where we expect to see carbon monoxide, we'd actually only see about one data point. I'd look a bit like this, um, which gives us an idea of the levels that we're thinking about and the continuum of that spectrum, but doesn't tell us much else um, about what's going on. Whereas if I was to take the spectrum from the ground, uh, infinite signal to noise, my spectrum in this region would actually look something like this. So we have many, many spectral lines and they contain lots of information. We can see the depth of the line. We can see the ratio of line depth. So we can see how each line is compared to each other. We can see how wide the lines are. And we can also see the exact positions of the lines. Now it's very hard for random chance or indeed systematics to exactly match this very specific pattern that only carbon monoxide can make. Those are the physical laws of our universe. And each molecule has its own unique pattern of lines. So if we're able to track down this spectral fingerprint, we can be very robust about the detections we're making, and we can learn a lot about what's going on from that spectrum. Now, in a perfect world, we would actually be able to do this and actually get this high resolution spectrum. So um, if we were to use, for example, CryRes on the VLT, um, in a perfect world, this is what our spectrum of our planet would look like but it doesn't, it looks more like this. So this is actually the extracted spectrum of um, Tau Butis B, which is only three milliarc seconds from its host star, it's actually a hot Jupiter. But you can see that even if I were to try and convince myself that maybe, maybe some of these lines actually match up, the signal to noise of those features in the actual observed spectrum is about one, okay? They don't really stick out from the noise. So we have to do something a bit extra. Um, we need to be able to sum together all of the signal from those lines. And that's where a key part of this technique comes in, which is cross-correlation or some form of template matching. Now, what does that mean? That means we take our observed spectrum, for example, here um, in black, these are all toy models. Um, and I, I guess, I make a guess of what I think my planet atmosphere is going to look like. And I scan my model, shown in blue, through the atmosphere, until it perfectly overlaps. And I create a cross-correlation function, which you see in the bottom. And when they perfectly overlap, we get a ping, and we get a very high signal. Um, and if I was divide, to divide the whole cross-correlation function at the bottom by its standard deviation, I would get effectively a signal to noise. And I get very high signal to noise in that peak. So cross-correlation allows us to add together all of the signal from all of the lines. And the lines are very, very faint because they're buried underneath the glare of the host star. Okay. So doing this, we can reach down to about contrast of about 10 to the minus four, 
But in doing so, we're actually using a trick there for close-in planets that relies on the Doppler shifting during the observations. Whereas for most of our young planets, um, they are directly imaged and they're widely separated. So what does that mean? How are we going to do this? So let's think about what we've actually got going on here. Let's think about the point spread function. So just how bright the star and the planet are um, as we go away from the very center. And that's what I've plotted here. So you can see if I had the star and the planet both very, very close together, my PSF of my star is up here, and then about 10,000 times fainter is my planet. Now, if I just did high resolution spectroscopy, maybe I could get down to here if the planet is moving fast, but if it's not, I need to do something else. Now, with direct imaging, we often use um, adaptive optics. And if I do that and I move my planet out, my adaptive optics suppresses the starlight so that as I get to the planet position now, I can actually pick it out from the noise. But if I now take this and add my high resolution spectroscopy on top of this, I can go even further down. So in principle, by combining these two methods, we can reach even further down into the noise and get better contrast ratios. Um, so this was the goal. Um, and the, this was first shown to, to work in observations in 2014. And um, this is what the ES uh, Snellen and the group of us in Leiden uh, did. So we took beta pick and its planet B, and we actually aligned a long slip spectrograph over both of them, a bit like this, and that projected down their spectra onto the detector. So what you're actually seeing here is a trace of the stellar spectrum, that's what this big white bit is, as we go along in wavelength, but buried underneath it, along this row, is the planet spectrum. Now what we can do, we need to get rid of the star, and we want to use our cross-correlation. So these bright rows where our star is, we can use those to make a reference. We make a reference spectrum that contains the stellar spectrum and Earth's telluric spectra. And every single row along this slit contains to some level tellurics and star. And it's only really this row that contains the planet spectrum. So you can see that we could scale and remove this model of our, our reference uh, stellar and telluric spectrum. And if we did that, we'd be left with noise and then buried in that noise again is our very faint planet spectrum. And if we were to cross correlate every row with our model, we would hopefully get back some kind of detection at the planet position and nowhere else. And we would probably also find the planet to be somewhat offset in velocity space because it's at some point in its orbit. It's gonna have a Doppler shift as well. So that's what we did. These are the cross correlations now. And hopefully you're convinced that at the planet position, we see some peak here in our uh, cross correlation values. So this was the detection of beta pic B using high resolution spectroscopy. Um, and this was actually uh, showing the detection of carbon monoxide. Okay, so this was done with cryres, and this was at a resolution of about 100,000. That's pretty high. Do we actually need that? Well, the answer is not necessarily. Uh, what I'm showing you here is um, a sequence from um, uh, Rufio et al, where they use OSIRIS, which is on KET, and it has a resolution of about 4,000. Now, OSIRIS is an integral field spectrograph, so in this block that you're seeing here, Every uh, pixel in there is a spectrum. And they were able, so for HR8799, with these four planets, they were actually able to situate the IFU directly over planet C, um, work through the spectra, make the spectral cube, and do, uh, they use a log likelihood, which is uh, similar to the cross correlation. It has the same effect to really bring up the signal. Um, <clears throat> so if we actually extract the spectrum then that we get here, and these are two papers um, from Queen Kronopake and Travis Barman showing you planets B and C. So in the orange, blue, and green, you see the models they used in their cross correlation. And then on here in the red, you see the actual spectrum of the planet. And then down here at the bottom are the cross correlation functions. And you can see uh, fairly strong signals of water in both of them um, and some CO here in uh, planet C as well. So that was a resolution of 4,000. Okay, so so far I've shown you things where we know the planet is, but can we actually use this to find planets? Well, yes, I think we can. This hasn't actually been done, as far as I know yet, on finding a brand new system, um, but we'll come to PDS 70 later. Um, but the experiment was done again on beta pick 
B. It's just very bright. It's one of the best targets out there to practice on. Um, so what I'm going to show you is um, data from the Symphony Integral Field Spectrograph at the VLT. And I'm going to show you two nights, and they're not very good nights. Um, what I'm going to show you is the collapsed spectrum. So it's what we call a white light image. So I've just summed the spectrum together and used classic um, direct imaging techniques to try and find the planet. And it wasn't a brilliant night. So in both of these images is beta pick B. And maybe you can convince yourself that it shows up here. Now, instead, if we use this cross-correlation approach, um, we scale and remove the star and the telerics from every single pixel in here, we do our cross-correlation, you end up with this. So you see a huge improvement over the direct imaging, classic direct imaging techniques on a relatively poor night. Um, and so in principle, we didn't need to know where the planet was to do this. It would just work. So you could use this as a new method for going out and finding new exoplanets um, with a relatively low resolution spectrograph in the sense that Symphony is, is a few, uh, around a few thousand as well, similar to Osiris. Um, so this is worked by uh, Jens Ruhrmachers, um, but there's also uh, other work from uh, Petit de la Roche um, and Jason Wyington that you can look at on this as well. Okay, so we can find it and we can use it to tell us about composition. Um, if we think further into the future with the extremely large telescopes, we don't necessarily need to constrain ourselves to young systems to do this. If we have a planet that's bright enough and close enough that we can resolve it on the sky, for example, Proxima b, our nearest rocky exoplanet, we can use the same technique. And this is a simulation for METIS, which will be on the ELT, um, one of its first light instruments. Um, and in this simulation, I'm showing you the X and Y position. This is sort of the collapsed image. But just so you get a feel for that velocity space, I'm going to let the cube rotate. And you'll see that as it comes round, um, you can see that the planet is clearly offset in velocity as well from where the star is. Um, and for Proxima b, we're also in the unique situation that it has uh, its actual orbital period is about 12 days. So you would actually see it physically move around in the image as well. So you could combine it all together. Now, one of the reasons we're particularly interested in these nearby rocky planets is that potentially we can look for biomarkers. So what I'm showing you here is simply um, spectral energy distributions for the sun and the earth. So you can get an idea of the contrast. Now, from the ground, once we go redder than about five microns, um, this high resolution approach doesn't really work very well compared to other methods. Um, it works best uh, short of that um, where the thermal background is less. In particular, if you look over here in the optical, there's a feature from oxygen. And we'd have to do this in reflected light rather than thermal emission. But if we can do that, we have this technique that's very robust that would be able to look for oxygen in the atmosphere, say Proxima b. Um, unfortunately, there are many instruments being designed for the ELTs. Um, so this is the ELT, the GMT, and the TMT um, that potentially will be able to do this. And our broad estimations from doing this, sort of a basic simulation for Proxima b, is that you would need about four nights at the ELT to be able to unambiguously detect oxygen on the nearest rocky exoplanet. Now, that doesn't mean you found life. You need to find lots of biosignatures, CO2, methane, water, to be able to do that, but it's a good start. Um, and oxygen in itself can tell you some very interesting things about geology as well. So, pretty exciting stuff. And if we take a look at the kinds of planets that are out there that are actually accessible, um, this is just showing you as a function of separation and um, this uh, planet star flux ratio, the Proxima is actually down here, and that there are some other temperate worlds that we could potentially look at in reflected light. Um, this is from a paper by Lovis et al. in 2016, and this diffraction limit here is actually for the VLT, um, so the ELT would be, would be closer in. Um, and uh, Christoph Lovis actually even considered trying to uh, make an instrument that combines sphere and espresso at the VLT with this sort of fiber bundle that you see here around the star to actually try and start doing this already rather than waiting for the ELT. So pretty exciting. The ELT will do incredible things, not just for small temperate worlds, but for giant planets as well. At the very beginning, I showed you that very messy spectrum from Tau Bootis B. Um, and then this was taken from the VLT and took 15 hours. If I did the exact same thing with the ELT, so I've just made the mirror bigger, you would get a spectrum that looked like this. So all that noise has gone away 
And what you have here is a very high signal to noise spectrum of a hot Jupiter. So each line itself has a signal to noise of about 10. So you can actually start treating exoplanets like you would a star in terms of trying to determine their properties observationally, um, which will be pretty spectacular in the kind of information that we can get out from this. Okay, so we've talked about composition. We've talked about finding things by combining these techniques, but let's go a bit deeper into what we're actually getting from this data. So remember, we're getting a spectrum, not necessarily this signal to noise, um, and we're combining all of the signal together from each line. So um, Andy uh, talked about this a bit. Um, let's think about what our planet is actually doing. If I was to take a spectrum at different points on the disk of Jupiter as it's rotating, um, if I took ones on the left-hand side, all the spectra would be Doppler shifted to the blue. And if I took them on the right-hand side, they would be Doppler shifted to the red. Now, when I observe an exoplanet, I can't resolve the disk. So everything was bunched up together. And the effect of that is that my spectrum, I just get one integrated spectrum of the disk, is that the lines are broadened just by summing together all of those red and blue shifting ones. So the broadening of that line tells me something about the rotation rate of the planet itself. And it wasn't until we had high resolution um, that we could actually do this. So thinking back to that beta pick result I showed you, taken from the long slit, if I actually extracted the cross correlation function, if there was no rotation, the width of it, we would expect to be broadened purely to our instrument um, resolution. Uh, but that's not what we saw. What we saw is this. So the dotted line shows you sort of the cross correlation you'd get just at the instrument resolution, and the solid line is what we actually saw. And so it's broadened with a, a V sine I, so we've got an unknown inclination in here, of about 25 kilometers per second, or a rotation rate of about eight hours. Um, and as Andy mentioned, um, we started to look at this, um, we started to compare planet mass as a function of, of V sine I. Um, and if you look at the solar system, it, it sort of starts to form a bit of a trend, but we don't really have that many data points here. And so since then, a lot more work has been done. Um, so other work with CryRes, but also uh, a large number of results from Marta Bryan using NearSpec, which has a resolution of about 25,000. Um, and recently also from KPEC, um, where the resolution is, is a bit lower, this is work by Jason Wang, um, also measuring rotation rates. Um, and if you put them all together, this is a plot from Jason's paper, there is maybe some tentative evidence that potentially there is a trend here. But from, from Marta's and Jason's uh, work, generally we've seen, or it seems to be that things are consistent with planets uh, being spun down by some magnetized certain planetary disk. And uh, I'll remind you of the uh, ALMA discovery today of the second, planet, uh, second planetary disk. Um, I encourage you definitely to check that out. Um, and it seems like magnetic breaking at early times is potentially less efficient at spinning down low mass planets. Okay. And one last thing to keep in mind is that because we've measured the V sine I, we have that inclination in there that's unknown. That's the actual inclination um, of our planet axis. So if we can actually measure the true rotation rate of the planet, maybe by measuring its uh, light curve, if we could see some photometric variability, and actually solve for I, you could actually completely solve for the obliquities in the system. So you'd be able to tell if there's an axial tilt for your planet. I think this would be very difficult to do with the ELT for rocky things. Um, but if you're interested in, say, the tilt uh, that maybe Jupiter has, which is three degrees versus Uranus, which is almost 90 degrees, um, this is a technique potentially that you could use to do that. So uh, we've now added in rotation and potentially uh, seasonality effects as well. OK. Right, stick with me. We've got about five minutes left to go. Um, so Andy talked about mapping. I just want to uh, go through the technique just a little bit more. Um, so with mapping, uh, we're relying on techniques that have been used for stars um, in terms of mapping spots on stars. And that's kind of what you're seeing here, is that as you get a spot that rotates into view, it blocks on this side, it will block some of the blue shifting light. And as it comes out to this side, it will block some of the red shifting line. And that has an effect on the average line shape. And remember that our cross correlation function is an approximation of the average line shape. And so if we're able to pick up these deviations, we could trace back what's actually going on. So I've uh, borrowed an animation here, um, which is actually designed to show you uh, spots or planets going in front of stars. 
um, from Marshall Johnson, but you can actually imagine this as maybe, so the great red spot on Jupiter rotating in and out of view. And this is the effect that it would have on a line shape. And as Andy pointed out, this has been done for a brown dwarf. This is uh, Lumen 16b, one of our very nearest brown dwarfs um, by Ian Crossfield and Beth Filler. Um, and you can start to see variations on the surface. Um, and so we'd like to be able to do that for giant planets. And so we did some simulations for the ELT, um, thinking about if there was a hot spot on Beta Pic as it was rotating. So that's what you're seeing here, this is a simulation. So if I did what I did near the beginning where I just put my long slit over Beta Pic and I got this big cross correlation function, I would get this dotted line. And actually it's been divided by 25 because the signal is so strong. But because there's so much signal, I can actually bin down my data in time. So maybe I observed an hour, but I can bin it down to say five minute intervals. What I would see would be the peak of this cross correlation function moving. And that would be an indication of being able to see that spot moving because it would be changing the blue shifting and red shifting light that I was getting um, from my integrated spectrum. So the hope is that we can actually map out planets, um, some giant planets with the ELT uh, fairly efficiently. So I think that will be very exciting to do. Okay, so I've managed to give you a talk without showing the picture of PDF 70, um, but we should talk about it because it's quite a, quite a clever way of um, actually uh, pulling out the signal of what's going on. So um, this is work by Sebastian Hafford, uh, who was a grad student in Leiden at the time. Uh, he's now a Sagan fellow, I think. Um, so uh, what I'm showing you here is the uh, Sphere H-band image of PDF 17. You can see this nice uh, disk feature and that certain planetary disk is in here somewhere. And these contours actually show you the H-alpha image um, that I'm going to describe how we actually made it, how uh, Sebastian and his team actually made it. So they used an integral field spectrograph called Muse on the VLT. Muse doesn't have a coronagraph, um, it's just, just uh, IFU. And so every pixel in their image uh, gave them a spectrum. So they pulled the same trick. They said, okay, well, the star pretty, pretty much obliterates this image, it's everywhere, and so is the background. So we're gonna make a reference spectrum by taking an average or a median of all of the pixels together. Um, we're gonna normalize the spectrum and divide it out. Now that gets rid of um, the features from the host star in the background but it leaves you with some variations in the continuum. Um, so you need to sort of do a low order fit of some kind or a low pass filter to try and model that continuum and divide that off of every spectrum as well. What that leaves you with is just the high uh, narrow, or sort of the narrow features um, that vary throughout. Um, unfortunately, some of those features are related to system aesthetics and, and um, yeah, just problems in the instrument. So you can use a principal component analysis to actually try and identify those systematics because you've got nearly, uh, I think it's something like nearly 100,000 samples of it from every, every pixel. Um, and so you can get a good idea of what's going on, model them and remove them. And what you're left with is noise. But if you've got any very strong spectral lines, for example, if you have HR for an emission from accretion, um, it will really stick up out above that noise. So you can just divide everything by the standard deviation and anything that sticks up will look high signal to noise. So that's what they did. And this is what they got. So the two white features here are the detections of H-alpha. And just to prove to you, I'm gonna take show you the spectra from these different boxes. So in orange, where there's no planet, at 656 six nanometers, there's no H-alpha. But where there are planets, you see the feature popping up really strongly. Um, so this is a way to go and look for individual lines that you might expect to see very strongly, for example, like H-alpha and any of those other accretion um, like uh, features as well. So very exciting, very uh, nice way of finding very young uh, exoplanets. Okay, um, so I'm going to squeeze in two little things. Um, so I have summarized an entire field of very dedicated work in a single sentence in that young stars are active, which makes radial velocities difficult. So there's some great talks from uh, Arkita and Raphael that you can look at to learn about that. Um, just to give you an example, uh, this is a radial velocity curve of a young system um, with a hot Jupiter in a nine day orbit. So we can't really use our direct imaging here, but what else can we do? How do we actually get a spectrum of this young uh, planet? Um, and so one of the things we can try um, is to again use our high resolution spectroscopy. I'll flag one thing first in that 
Young stars are active and they sometimes flare. If we have a super flare, which is what you're seeing here from Proxima B, uh, sorry, Proxima Centauri, the actual star itself, and these two plots at the top there actually a zoom in of the features down here on the left and the H alpha line down here on the right. Um, and each row in here is a spectrum. And you can see that our line, as we flare, really blows up, really expands. And so throughout this talk, I've been saying the star is always the same, the star is always the same. And actually here the star has changed. And so that potentially is a problem for being able to remove the star and the Tularex from our spectra. Um, but why not give it a try? Um, and if you're persistent, you can do it, but you have to use this trick of the planet Doppler shifting. So we can't have the spatial separation, but the planet is moving. Um, so we use that movement instead. And if you're very patient, very dedicated, and very persistent, you can do this. Um, uh, so this is work from Laura Flagg, and what I'm showing you here is uh, her detection of a two million year old uh, hot Jupiter in a nine day orbit, um, which was consistent with one of the hot start models um, that you're looking at in your hands on session. This is not a molecule map. Um, what you're seeing here is a velocity space where the strongest signal lines up with the system velocity that we know the star and the planet have as they move through the galaxy. Um, and this tells you the planet's radial velocity semi amplitude, which is very large compared to the star. Okay, right, I'm gonna stop there. I'll leave you with the take-home messages that you can read and yeah, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for the great talk. Um, the first question for you is, it's a quick question to start with. You use the word temperate words and what do you mean by that? So by a temperate world, I sort of mean something similar to Earth, but I'll describe it as basically something where yeah, about 300 Kelvin, something where you might be able to have liquid water on the surface. And this question has been up for a while, and Jane, you mark, you will answer live, so here it is. Are there any attempts on putting on shell spectrograph with an optical frequency comb calibrator on board a space-borne telescope? Yeah, so I, I think this question was in relation to the um, precision RV measurements. Um, but as you can see, it would be very nice to be able to have a high resolution spectrograph in space for characterization as well. Um, and even though we can handle the Tellurix to some level, it would be very advantageous to go into space so we don't have to deal with them. But the advantage in space is that it's much cooler. And so we can actually go beyond that five micron uh, pause that I showed. We can actually, you know, we could like JWST go out all the way to, I don't know, 25 microns or something. And that opens up a lot more wavelength space that you could use. Um, so I would love to put one in space. I think there's been, a, there are attempts um, with balloons, so airborne balloons, um, and also trying to shrink the size of the spectrograph by using um, different gratings as well. The next question is, finding the planet location using the cross-correlation method would require the use of model planet atmosphere. How are the temperate parameters of these model atmospheres are uh, determined? Yeah, so, um, so I, think, I think the question is just how, how, do, how do you know what it looks like? Um, and you are essentially making educated guesses. Um, so you can use codes like what's being used in the hands-on session to generate um, forward models that you would actually take and, and do your cross-correlation with. Um, you can sort of fold this into... There are people are working at the moment to do a, a more retrieval-like um, approach to this. So um, Mike Line and Materi Broji are working on this and, and several others. Um, I think Beyond Benefit's group work on this as well. So. You know, we're taking educated guesses, and then the more retrieval-like things you can do, uh, easier it gets. But dealing with the high resolution and the cross-correlation is not super straightforward. Thank you. Um, probably the last question for you is, what is the threshold temperature difference on the exoplanet surface that can be detected using present Doppler imaging techniques? On the surface, I'm... Not, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I, I don't think we're going to be mapping continents and rocky exoplanets anytime soon. I think we'll be able to map features in giant planet atmospheres. Does that answer it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jane, for the great talk. And I think that's it for the session. So thank you all the speakers for the great talks. Um, Don, if you